Bob Cornwall, thanks for talking to me this morning. Hey, glad to do so. So, we uh, we've both read Tony Jones' book, uh, That's The right. Church yeah. is Flat, and um, I posted some comments uh, um, on the Disciples Intersection, uh, aka the Hope Partnership for Missional Transformation website. We're sort of in between making this transition right now. <laughs> And um, I, I really appreciated the comment that you made there about there being this history within the disciples tradition of, of, of carrying through uh, um, tradition and, 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 and being open to change and, and being open to reform and, and movement. And um, I just I was curious to get more of your thoughts on that. And I, I think of you as being one of these bridge people. Who 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 understands the past and understands the traditional stuff, but you're also you're right out there on the on the front edge of of, of the new thinking and ideas and and you're open and, and and you're playing with all this stuff and so I you're somebody that I really appreciate Bob and um, so I appreciate you uh, sharing some more thoughts. Well, thank you, uh, and I appreciate you uh, engaging in all of us in this conversation. Uh, I have been uh, interested in this whole conversation about missional and emergent and uh, have been reading that and, and like you read Tony's book and um, it, it was helpful to, to see his pers inside perspective as to the development and what that means. Um, and yet at the same time, I mean, there's a sense in which that what Tony's talking about and what the emergent folks are talking about is, you know, doing something like brand new. And uh, the disciples as a tradition, uh, you know, we were born on the on the American frontier um, 10, 12 years after the nation is formed. And it's a frontier movement. And it has all the benefits, but also there are concerns that emerge out of that. Um, we, we are, there's a sense in which this one thread that's been part of our of our tradition, um, it's often called uh, uh, restorationism, is that we kind of threw everything out, which was like the American way. Uh, everything that the traditions from from the the old country, from Europe, uh, from England, uh, you know, that was an old way of doing things, and we don't have to do it that way anymore. And the American uh, tradition has been, uh, let's move west. If your neighbor gets too close to you. Uh, then you can move further, further west. And what's interesting is that we were born on the American frontier, which at that time was Western Pennsylvania. So, I mean, this is, I mean, you move past Pittsburgh and you were on the frontier. You were in Kentucky, you were in Eastern Ohio, you were on the frontier. Uh, being from Oregon and California, uh, you know, that's, that was a, a dream area that you, might get to, but it wasn't even on the, on the conversation piece for the most part, uh, in 1809, 1801, and 1810 and those in that era. And so, um, there was a sense of just throwing everything off, starting new, starting fresh. We don't have to do it the way we used to do it, which has a lot of benefits. And I think I see that a lot in the conversation that, that, uh, we're having right now about the church and, uh, you know, uh, we don't have to do it the way the de old denominational ways. Uh, we can get rid of denominations. We can go out on our own. Um, we don't need ordination. Uh, I think that's a theme that's in Tony's book is in, I, in, in conversation with Tony and watching what he's reading. That's been part of his conversation is wh why do you need ordination? Uh, why do you need uh, a denomination to give you uh, authority? And, uh, and that's part of the conversation in the book. And that's part of our history as disciples. Uh, we're an anti-clerical movement in its, in its origins. Um, you know, we had elders, which were lay elders, and we still have lay elders who are at the table. We're one of the few um, mainline Protestant, well, we're probably the only mainline Protestant denomination that doesn't require clergy to be at the, the Lord's table, the, the communion table, for there to be a... A sacrament. Uh, I mean, I'm normally at the table, but if I'm gone, an elder takes takes that person's place, my place, 
And if we really push it, then even an elder doesn't need to be there. So there is that sense of, you know, why do you need, why do you need clergy? So what, in a sense, the, what is emergent today, uh, is pretty similar to what disciples were 200 years ago. So I can see the, the, the connections. The, the danger I see in all of this, and this is why I, I posted my comment about continuity and tradition, is that some of the things I hear said and written, uh, see written about um, the, the denominations and about, you know, we don't need all of that, uh, that's eerily uh, reminiscent of our own tradition. And we discovered over time is that that freedom to do whatever you want uh, has some issues, has some problems. And so um, I'm, while I'm engaged in that conversation with folks like Tony and Doug uh, Paget and others, um, part of me says, okay, but wait a minute. Uh, let's look at this from a broader perspective. And, uh, you know, is missional, is emergent, and is all the things we're talking about right now, uh, doing these new things, is, is this simply a, a, a fad? Is this something that's, you know, that won't last beyond this current generation of, of leaders? So those are the kinds of con uh, concerns that I have. But I, but as you said, um, I see myself as pers as a bridge, as a person, one foot in the denomination, uh, but also in a foot in these other conversations. Perhaps it's because I'm in my 50s and um, I'm a decade older than most of the people who are leading the conversation in the emergent group. So call it age, I suppose, <laughs> uh, is, is part of that. So that's those are kind of the concerns that I that register with me yeah. as as we uh, move forward in the conversation. Right. Would you say it? Are, do you see? kind of the conversation around um, the leveling of hierarchies, the priesthood, you know, elevating the priesthood of all believers that you, that Tony's talking about in his book that's kind of prevalent within the emergent church conversation as being, it, it sounds like you're saying that's part of our history as disciples, and yet over the last 100 plus years, we have implemented structure, we have created, uh, you know, uh, systems and structures to facilitate and um you know because we've 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 been we've we've been down this road a ways and we figured out that you do need some level of hierarchy and structure in order to do things and that's kind of where you know these emergent leaders you know are that's what they're going to find out you know um on down the line do you think that's sort of the inevitable Yeah, I, I think uh, there's a sense in which you, when you move from one generation to the next, that there, ha there has to be some way of carrying that on, uh, of passing on the, for a lack of a better word, the, the, the tradition from one uh, generation to the next. Um, what we discovered was, uh, over time, was that, uh, you know, there were a lot of people who would join in and they weren't all on the same page. And so there's a, there becomes confusion. And so how do you determine this? So we're in a, so to give you a sense, there's a, there was this anti-clerical feeling there, but there were a lot of different voices. And so certain voices came to the fore, people like Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, people began to pay attention to their writing. So they became they weren't they weren't bishops. They weren't uh, uh, official. They didn't have the official uh, denominational titles that maybe we have today. Um, but in their writings and in their speaking, they became that. And so, and to this day, you know, if you're a disciple, uh, you refer back to a Campbell and a Stone and say, okay, uh, we may not agree with everything they said or did, but they set the trajectory upon which we. Uh, exists. So we, we pass that down. What happened early on is that the, uh, is that we thought, okay, well, we started over again. It's like, um, you know, all this intervening 2000 years or 1900 years between 
the time uh, that by the end of the first century and in 1800, when uh, this new movement on the frontier starts, none of that really mattered. So there was a sense, we're just going to go back to the Bible and to the New Testament, and we'll just restore that. And, and we don't need, uh, we don't need creeds. And I'm not a creedal person myself, so I'm not necessarily uh, suggesting that's not, we need to go in that route. But there was a sense of Calvin and Augustine and these people, they really didn't matter. But what we discovered is that they did matter because they influenced the way we looked at things. And you can't simply throw everything off. And I'm not sure that uh, in, an, in the emergent uh, conversation that we can do the same thing. But sometimes the, 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 the conversation suggests that we can. And I'm not sure that it works that way. Right. And, and, and that's one thing I appreciated in, in my conversation with Tony um, is that he said very clearly, we're not going back. Um, we're not going back. We're going forward. And, um, and, and he was sort of challenging this idea of, 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 you know, going, you know, uh, sort of being an ax to, you know, church and, um, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of going back to early Christianity and, you know, some, some of the stuff that, that some of the house church folks and simple church folks and organic church folks have sort of, sort of suggested and claimed, you know, we're, right. we've, 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 we've created all these human, you know, structures and we need to dismantle all that and, you know, go back to this primal essence of what Christianity was supposed to, was always supposed to be. And, and Tony was sort of like, no, we're, <laughs> we're not doing that. We're going forward. And, um, so I think, um, I, I do appreciate that, but I do, um, well, one of the things that I've had conversations with people about, and and I don't know if you would want to say anything to this, but I mean, I feel like in the disciples there is a, there is structure, but compared to a lot of other mainline denominations, it's pretty it's pretty uh, minimal. You know, there's it's not as hierarchical and built up as as a lot of other mainline Protestant denominational structures, and it's accessible and. But that's not to say that there aren't abuses and that there that it, there isn't bad things that happen um, within the structure. So I, I the conversation that I've had is how do we how do we fix you know where where things are broken and you know um, uh, you know in terms of the regional uh, structure and, and so forth. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts or anything you'd want to say about that. Well, I think you're you're right in the sense that the disciples compared to uh, our brothers and sisters and other mainline denominations, uh, our structures are pretty minimal. Uh, and the influence that they have on local congregations is, is relatively uh, minimal and non-invasive. Uh, there's a sense in which, um, you know, if we invite them in, they are there. They're really the one place where uh, the regional church, more, even more so than, the, than we'll call the general or national church, has influence on, on congregations is clergy uh, because there is a the one thing that the regions control is what we call standing and, and that recognition and so um, but congregations can hire anybody they want so you don't have to call to your congregation for leadership uh, a person who has standing uh, but you're wise to do so uh, for one thing is if there's a problem that develops, then uh, the, the, the region has some input. If you call someone who's not, then they really don't, you know, what can they do? So, um, so there, that's the one area what, that happens, but there's no top down. I mean, there's not a sense in which, I mean, a, a, a disciple congregation can be, uh, can say no gays in ministry, no gays in our church, no gays in our leadership. And another congregation can say, we're going to ordain gays and, um, or we're going to make gays as, uh, as elders and, or we're going to do gay marriage. And there's really nothing that either the region nor the general church can say one way or another. I mean, it can have conversations, uh, at, at, a, at, at those levels. And we don't even use the words levels. The manifestations is this word we created to use that. Um, we have those conversations. But ultimately, the local church makes the determination. Right. 
And uh, whereas, you know, the, the Lutherans and the Methodists and the Presbyterians are having big debates over uh, the ordination of, of gay and lesbian uh, clergy, uh, that happens, I mean, regions can decide whether or not to recognize a person based on that, but local congregation to do what they want. So yes, there is a lot less uh, invasiveness, you might say, which gives congregations a lot more freedom. Um, but, you know, there, there's the pros and cons on that as well. Sure. Yeah, I feel like, um, and, and kind of where Tony and I got in, in our conversation was he just admitted to being, in, in, in his worst moments, very cynical about um, the there being any chance for denominations um, with 50 to 100 plus years of history and 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 hierarchy and structure to you know be able to change in any significant way to to foster new kinds of thinking and new you know um new new forms of church and i you know i understand his cynicism you know but i i you know i i said i think um I, i'm hopeful that that we can prove you wrong tony um because i think the the disciples is a place where this is possible, um, and, and and that's not to criticize any other denomination because the disciples were very ecumenical and in partnership with all those other folks, and that's another thing I love about the disciples, um, and that's very emergent of the of the disciples to me, right. um, and so uh, you know, but tell me, I, I wanted. Um, I, I, just in terms of uh, bridge building, because when we talk about change and we talk about um, this new thing, this new conversation that's happening and new ideas and stuff, people people get scared. You know, people people get worried about what's this going to mean for us and our our local congregation. You know, over here and I think you. I mean, um, at the missional track at General Assembly this summer. I mean, I think you had. Um, the biggest group of people gathered around you, and it looked like you were having a great conversation with folks. And it seemed like you are someone who, who um, again, gets this stuff and can translate it and, 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 and speak it to, to folks wherever they're at in, in a way that's, that's, you know, you just translate it well and, 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 and in a way that doesn't freak people out and helps people understand and learn and grow and, you know... <clears throat> Um, what was that? What was your experience at General Assembly like, and what were the conversations that you're having there? Well, I, in terms of that track, I think one of the reasons why I, I did uh, attract a, a group is that the, everyone who stood up in front of me uh, and, and introduced their their conversations uh, turned to be uh, rather a scary. Uh, and my, uh, it's like uh, total change. And my, I, I said, well, I pastor a a, a rather tr you know a church that's been around for a while and, and, and recognizing that this whole idea of being missional uh, doesn't happen overnight. And, uh, you know, and I think that there's a lot of congregations out there that would like to, to evolve and, and to do new things, but, um, but they've been burned in the past because they've, they've, um, the, you know, uh, and I've been at this in, involved. I've been ordained now for 26 years so, uh, you know, we had, we had church growth, we had seeker, we had all these things. And, you know, you go to a general assembly and you go to a, 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 a workshop and they tell you, Hey, this is, this will change your church. So you go back and it doesn't change your church overnight. And so it doesn't work and you're back to draw. You know, you, then the next time around you, okay, what's the latest thing? And, um, I think missional and emergent sound like the latest thing. We've been there before. Uh, tell me how this works. And my message that I wanted to deliver there in our conversation was that it doesn't change overnight. That, uh, you know, you have to find ways and places to, to bring that along. And I've been at uh, Central Woodward now for a little over three years. So I'm in my fourth year. When I came, uh, the conversation was we would like to be a missional congregation. But uh, so we had a starting point. I mean, they'd already begun the conversation. Uh, they'd, uh, they'd read Alan Roxburgh. Some of the people had gone to a, a leadership training with Roxburgh. So they'd have, they, 
the, the, the vocabulary was already planted. But when I got there, when I asked the question, what is missional to you? They weren't all sure. I don't think that they're all sure today. And um, so it's an ongoing thing. The majority of my congregation is older. So how do you take that older congregation uh, along this journey and and recognize that they, as a congregation, as people, they, they want to see that congregation live beyond that. Uh, I don't think in my congregation that there are very many people that, that would be satisfied uh, for Central Woodward to disappear uh, once they're gone. That, you know, just... Uh, let's just hang on for the next three or four years while I'm alive, and then after that, I don't care. I don't hear that. I don't see that. In fact, some of the most um, supportive people to the conversation are my people who are in their 80s and up to 90, because they know that their days are numbered, but they also want uh, to see things change and grow and continue on once they're gone. I find that there's more resistance to the changes among those who are my age in their 50s mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they don't see the urgency as much as the ones who are in their 80s. Uh, so um, now one of the things that concerns, and I think that's what happened uh, in that conversation was people were saying, okay, I, I, I'm part of this of a church that um, – that is an older congregation. We've been around. Uh, you know, we're, we're not in the position to just start over again. And uh, we have a lot of older people. And to just say, okay, you know, we can forget you and we're going to go with young, everything for young, young people, you know, young adults or whatever. And they're saying, okay, but we're not dead yet. We're still alive. What about us? We're, it's not that we need everything focused on us, but... We are still here. Right. And I've had people come to our congregation from other congregations that have um, kind of switched over to the co total contemporary. And, and the message that they have received from the leadership of those churches is you don't, ma you don't matter anymore. Uh, just go, go, go away, go die, leave your money if you'd like, but just get out of the way. Mm. And, you know, those old hymns that mean a lot to them, well, those are, those are, you know, that doesn't matter anymore. And so I think that, you know, it's, it, part of it is a lack of respect for those who, um, who've been around for a while. And one of the things I've tried to do as a, as a, as a pastor and in, involved in this is, to say this is we're we're changing, we're doing new things, we're implementing new things, we're being aware of what's going on, but not throwing away our our tradition, our old our our people who've been around, and uh, that's a hard thing to do, and it won't happen overnight. So you're kind of planting with one hand, and you're caring for those who've been around. Uh, Another one. one. One of the conversations that happened at General Assembly in that little group was a lady was saying, you know, we're an older congregation. How do we do this? Uh, our people don't are, are uncomfortable with, you know, new people coming in. But the, the lady said, but we, we have a lot of people uh, at the nursing home. So I said, you know, one of the things when we talked about it is uh, why don't you plan a Bible study? Have that Bible study that you want. Have it at the nursing home. That can be a missional outreach. You're caring for, you're carrying the gospel, you're carrying life to people who are not able to get to the con get to the um, to the church. So you're working outside the walls. That's being missional. Now it might not be hip and it might not be exciting in, in many ways, but it is an expression of missional life. And if we can see uh, that in broader terms, you know that then. I think we can get people on board. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I appreciate what you said there because I think that's really helpful for. Uh, I hesitate. I, I'm hesitant to say it, but younger leaders maybe who are coming in and 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 where many of the opportunities are maybe um, in established congregations that that are at that point of saying we 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 we're hearing this missional language. 
we're 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 ready to 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 move and adapt. Um, uh, we don't know that we totally get it, kind of like the situation you described, but we're willing to 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 go. You know, help us to move in that direction, and and that's helpful um, for those leaders to kind of, um, you know. Uh, that's just good, just helpful advice and how to approach those kinds of situations because we're gonna we're gonna need leaders transformational leaders who can who can take on those ministry roles and and to help to uh, move some of our existing churches uh, along as you've done there and um, I, I'm curious you know they they you said that they had some they'd gotten some of the language and they had some of the ideas but did did uh, did you did you work with them to come to a consensus around what missional means? Did you, did you work with them around that definition and, and what did you come up with? If, if you well, we, 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 let's put it this way. It's a work, still a work in process. Okay. Uh, in progress. Uh, there is a sense in which, um, I think when I mention or when we mention the word missional, people say, okay, that means that we're broadening our horizons. That that um, that life, that the work that we do is not simply within the local congregation. Um, but that's part of our heritage as a congregation. I mean, it's there was a time, you know, 50, 60 years ago when we were one of the leading churches in the denomination. Um, we have a, uh, we've always had a strong uh, giving, outreach giving. Uh, I mean, we're. We're with we're a uh, hundred member church, and we're probably uh, in the top. Well, we have been in the top one hundred uh, giving churches through Disciple Mission Fund. Uh, I think we weren't last year, but the the church is interestingly enough. I think it's the churches from two hundred fifty to five hundred that the bulk of the giving to the denomination comes from that group. And we're, but we're, but we're probably in the top 125 out of 4,000 plus churches to think this little church of 100 people. Now, part of it is because of endowment. And we, we have, but, it, but that tells me that, that when, the, when the, these endowments were set up, that the people decided, you know, a portion of that money that will come from these endowments needs to go to outreach. It needs to go out to go beyond the local congregation. Um, that's missional in my mind. That's an expression of that. Uh, it doesn't replace the giving of now, but it does, uh, as though I re- used the word yesterday in my stewardship sermon, uh, it amplifies our giving. Uh, and so, but that's part of who we are. So I could tap into that. But what it means now is to getting us uh, as individuals engaged on a regular basis that we're uh our bodies getting our bodies out and and that's a little more difficult than writing a check um but i see them doing that but it's it's a long-term kind of conversation and it doesn't change overnight so it's like i've been here a little over three years uh i had a five-year plan in my mind you know here's where we would be in five years um, I'm kind of thinking, well, it's a seven year plan. Uh, we, we're continuing to lay the foundations. We're continually doing the work. Um, but there's a lot that needs to still take place. And, uh, and part of it is, is, uh, we're living in an age when, um, you know, traditional established congregations, it's harder to get people to even darken the doors of our congregations. How do you get the word out in an age where people are either going to mega churches or no church at all? Mm. And, uh, you know, we can look at the mega churches and what, you know, the full, full scale programs and all that they do. And, um, they reach a certain segment of population, but the vast majority of of people in our, in our communities, they're not going anywhere, but they're also not even looking. And so uh, it's a tough road to get people even to, to look at you. Mm-hmm. And, and that's been our, that's been our, uh, uh, our dilemma. You know, we're, we're yeah. doing things, we're trying to be out there, but, you know, it's not an easy task. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
Bob, thanks uh, for sharing a little bit more of uh, your story and the work that you're doing with your congregation and um, and for your voice in the disciples uh, and uh, in this conversation. Um, really appreciate um, taking the time to have this conversation. Did you? Have, is there any other thoughts that are just burning on the tip of your brain that you wanted to throw out there? Well, I... Um... Now, there's a lot that's in the conversation that we need to pay attention to. Um, I appreciate being pushed by people like Tony, and by Doug Paget, and others, because that's important. Uh, but I think there needs to be a little pushback. And one of the things I, I, I when we were preparing for this conversation that I was in looking at the book, uh, I noticed that the people, the eight churches that uh, Tony looked at in the book, um, I only know the pastors of, really the only pastor of those groups that I know personally is Doug Padgett. Right. Um, and, and I love Doug a lot. I think he's a great guy. I think he's doing great ministry. He has great ideas. Um, but what I notice about him, and I'm not, I'm not sure what, well, I have met Brian McLaren too, um, and heard him and read him, but I'm not as familiar with the other six uh, leaders as I am with those two, but there is a sense of charisma, of personality, and that's where I wonder where this moves down the road because not every one of us has Doug's personality and charisma. I'm assuming that those other churches, many of those other churches, are led by persons with that kind of same personality, and not all of us have that. So how do we translate the ideas and and and, and all? into a, a broader conversation with people who might not have that same kind of personality. Right. So that's something to, to think about as we, as we have this conversation. And I think that's why we ultimately, uh, we organize ourselves is because, um, we need, we need to figure out how to pass this on without having people who are charismatic personalities like Doug and Brian, Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone <laughs> to go back uh, a couple hundred years. Right. So those are some things that you know that uh, uh, I, I think are worth looking at and considering and talking about, uh, continuing the conversation. But uh, as the old as the old saying goes, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> and I, that's I guess that's why I'm the bridge. I stand in uh, trying to be in the bridge person is that I'm supportive of being entrepreneurial and moving forward and planning interesting kinds of communities because I think that's essential. Uh, but at the same time, there are contexts and, and history has shown that, uh, you know, we've been down this road before we'll be down this road again and uh, we can learn from that. Absolutely. Well, thanks so. for helping us to learn from, uh, from those things, Bob. And uh, this won't be the last conversation. I'm sure that we'll be having. I look forward to future conversations, Steve. And thank you for your work uh, with Hope Partnership. So you bet. Keep, keep the good work going. All right.